So I would like to ask all of you what you think about that theory, that capitalists are pro-life because they just want more people, and more people that are very likely to be the kind of citizens that they're looking for. Because I've never really heard that explained anywhere, and it's just always the inclination that I've got after listening to so many of these. Like, does anybody really think Mike Pence cares about huh. unborn babies? Like, somebody like that. Um, yeah, one of my Facebook friends was put in Facebook jail for saying that Mike Pence is a fake Christian. <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> and you were put in Facebook jail for calling some someone a white supremacist or something. Yeah, well, I said white trash because oh, yeah. they, they posted something hideously racist. And I'm like, I'm like, sorry, but this is just, like, vile white trash crap. And... That's been going on a lot. Like so, again, like where where are the snowflakes, right? According to the right wing, uh, but they are reporting us for responding to their hate with aggression or assertive speech or something. It's just words on a screen. Like it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, like I I, I don't report them. I mean, like it's fine. But if I you have do that. seen. Yeah. I have seen people report accounts who say things like we should hang protesters from trees. Yes. And uh, Facebook said that it's not against our community guidelines, but they will ban accounts that say anything about white trash, white supremacists. So it really does make me wonder if Facebook upholds white supremacy, which is also a hallmark of right-wing ideology. So basically, Facebook's official uh, position is, but what about reverse racism? Okay, yeah. <laughs> we'll get we'll get into racism a bit more, maybe. Yes. Um, but as far as abortions, I do just want to make one more point that not all right-wingers are anti-abortion necessarily, but none of them want it to be publicly funded services. Like, mm -hmm. if they have to use their tax money to pay for Planned Parenthood, you know, a totally eugenicist, euthanasia, <laughs> anti-black operation yeah um then they're against that like you can get an abortion but you have to pay for it is what some right-wing libertarians would say yeah i mean there 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 is a little bit of of shady history to planned parenthood because like any government program has its issues with corruption and like unsavory people working in it at some point in their history and a lot of birth control and sterilization yeah. experimentation came out of hitler and, you know, that era. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was a shady start. But is that what they're doing to women today? Are they are they euthanizing them? Are they sterilizing them? Uh, I mean, it's... it's, it's, it's a lot just... of people would argue that contraception is what set the developing world apart from the third world. A lot of people would make that argument. And, and there is some legitimacy to it, I think. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's because people having the ability to decide when they have kids they have more control over their life they're exactly like, like they they can map out their life uh, in a way that you just can't if and also i don't like i, I want to say this about abortion though because like the complete judgment of and again the lack of empathy for making mistakes yeah what like what is wrong with people to where they feel so self-righteous and so justified and condemning people for having sex. You mean that you've never gotten lost in passion once in your life and had unprotected sex like that you shouldn't have? Well, I'm very sorry that you have such a complete lack of passion that you never, I mm. mean, like I like to think that I, I'm rational overall, but of course there are times in my life where I've just gotten caught up in the moment. You know, and I, I, who, who out there is not going to say that, you know, like who out there is going to be like, not me, I'm safe every single time, like as a 30 or 40 year old person. It's just, well, I mean, the conservative right has always tried to push the government to enact laws mm -hmm. against things like premarital sex. They, they, they try to outlaw contraception and, and premarital out, sex. It, well, not just and abortion. And, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, so contradictory. You don't want you know, birth control to keep abortions from happening. So, th and that that's why my theory is what it is, right? Because if you're going to outlaw birth control, if you don't want to protect babies. 
Uh, I mean, you, you don't you don't want to stop abortions if you're going to do that because, like, if you were taking birth control, there would be no fetus to abort, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they want to outlaw birth control and not have it paid for by the government, which is essentially outlawing it to a lot of people because they cannot afford it, mm-hmm. right? Oh, that's not my problem. I shouldn't have to provide for somebody who can't provide for themselves. So, I mean, you also... Sorry, that was my Ben Shapiro voice. Yeah. <laughs> no, you do a much better Ben Shapiro voice. Yeah, that wasn't really squeaky enough, was it? Yeah. <laughs> do, 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 do facts don't care about your feelings. What? Uh, I'll have to drop that later. <laughs> <laughs> Too much pressure. Yeah, but it's, again, that, that's why I think that it's just about, like, growing the population for the sake of capitalism. Because mm-hmm. if you outlaw abortion and you outlaw birth control, Obviously, you're just trying to make sure that there's more people. Forcing them to have kids. Exactly right. Uh, Which, I mean, a lot of people on the right also hate China because that's what our media pumps out. And they have to nerve the nerve to say that China's one-child policy is draconian and authoritarian. Well, it's, it's not like, really in effect anymore. Well, no, it's yeah. not. It's not. Mm-hmm. But over there, you know, they're forcing people not to have kids. Over here, they're forcing kid- people to have kids. At least that's how so, it was. is yes. it really any better? And also, China has over a billion people. Indeed. So... Is it wrong? I don't know. I'm not anti-China or pro-China. Yeah. Same. Uh, like, like we got a comment on the last podcast because like we like question the mainstream uh, media narrative about China and like whether the whole Uyghur camps are as bad as what they say they are. And somebody's like, I just can't listen to you anymore if you doubt that. I'm like, really? Because like we don't have a reason to question mainstream media narratives about other countries. They said that we're pro-China propagandists. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm not a fan of the Chinese government. I don't like them. No. Uh, I just don't trust anything that Western media has to say about them, especially when the origins came from Steve Bannon. Mm. Uh, yeah, not not going to trust that. I'm always going to question any Cold War or hot war narratives. Mm-hmm. I'm always going to yes, do that. Yes, and you should. Yeah. If it, you are patriotic, mm-hmm. then you should not willingly send your brothers and sisters off to a war, a mm-hmm. rich man's war that they have no right being in, mm-hmm. like in Iraq yeah. and in Afghanistan. We have no reason to be in these wars. And mm-hmm. if you really are a patriot, you wouldn't just let your brothers and sisters die because a capitalist on TV said that we should do it because they have weapons of mass destruction, right? Yeah. I'm not a patriot. I guess I'm not a patriot either. <laughs> I, I'm really not. I just don't. I, I don't understand the all the, oh, the like. We, we nationalism is something we're going to talk about. Yeah. Yes, that is definitely a part of right wing extremism. Yes. Nationalism is. Well, we've wrapped up abortion, right? We can yeah. Move on. Yeah. So, so should we talk about nationalism right mm-hmm. now? Yeah. Okay. Let's let's talk about that because. The right-wing ideology is very protectionist. Uh, they're very nationalistic. They really take pride in the place that their dad fucked their mom. <laughs> <laughs> because or of, the color of their skin. Yeah, that's something to be very proud of. Something you had nothing to do with earning. And nationalism is a huge factor in fascism. So Hitler was a nationalist. Yes. Donald Trump is a nationalist. Yes. They've called themselves as much. And also, like, the uh, cooperation between nations is, like, this terrifying concept to them. Because we like competition. Yeah, like, the globalists, right? The globalists. It's the big, bad globalists. Now, again, a one-world government, as things stand today, is a horrible idea. Right, it's just it's with the powers that are that are in force today, it's just not good. Um, one day, maybe in the future, once we're more advanced and humanitarian, and humanitarian, and like we're actually like have like our society operates from principles of bettering the condition of humanity and expanding our knowledge and exploring space, innovation. Maybe at that point, we could all unite into one people, and it'd be a lot safer. But right now, I definitely would not. Because you know who would yeah. run the government exactly and the right. world. The oligarchs. Yeah. Exactly right. So it would be a bad idea. But this whole like right-wing ideology of like cooperation and like not behaving like a bully prick toward every <laughs> country is somehow bad. Like like what what is that? I don't understand. Like why do we have to like wag our dicks <laughs> at, at like every other country and bully them into doing what we want them to do? I mean, we have destroyed our relations with countries and had China swoop in 
and become the superpower that those countries are doing business with because of how bad our behavior has been toward these places. And now that there is like a viable alternative to the U.S. in China, even though they do have serious problems, you know, like I never want anybody to get the impression that we are pro-China. We're not. We just do not believe all the bad stuff being said about China coming out of the U.S. Mm-hmm. That, 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 that's our position on China. But it, yeah, but with the nationalism, mm-hmm. especially in the United States, mm-hmm. it is really what keeps us othering yes. all of the minority groups that we have in this country. Mm-hmm. Because we are, you know, what they say, a melting pot. Mm-hmm. Um, but we force our English language onto everybody who comes here. We don't try yes. to learn anyone else's. Yep. Um, we force our culture, or lack thereof, mm-hmm. <laughs> onto everybody. And we view any sort of deviation from cultural norms as like an existential threat. Yes. Like, and that's uh, something that's become a lot more normalized. I mean, like, there, not too long ago, it was kind of very unpopular and unsavory and only relegated, it was relegated to like extreme corners of the internet to talk about that white European culture uh, should be, you know, is, is like under attack, you know, because that, that, that was always like a white supremacist like talking point, right? But now with the, with the rise of figures like Jordan Peterson and these, these other shills who try to normalize the idea that like European culture uh, is civilization, uh-huh. right? Yeah, like, it, it, colonialism it, civilized. It, exactly right. Like, like it, it is like the only uh, way that society should function. And it's just this complete arrogance of our way is the best way. And that, that feeds into American exceptionalism, mm-hmm. you know, like the, the nationalism that, that, that we're currently talking about. It's like, and, and that's why even though other countries are far better than America in so many outcomes on health, universal health care, for example, all of that. Whenever you have nationalism and you have this sense of we are the best just because we are, not, not for any scientifically verifiable reasons why, but just because we say so. Mm-hmm. When you're operating from that position, it's very easy to just shun information coming from elsewhere because like they're the out group yeah. right they're the other we're the best we know we're the best we know america is the greatest we've been told by hollywood and news media and everything else our whole lives that america is the best and you're lucky to be here mm-hmm. so and that's why we do not accept religious freedom not really in this country mm-hmm. like christianity is the only acceptable one mm-hmm. otherwise you're going to get weird stares from people you're going to be labeled as a terrorist you know if you're a muslim you're gonna have a really hard time in this country Mm -hmm. and it also explains why americans only know english other white european nations know three or four different languages Mm -hmm. including english and it's just so pathetic because we feel like we shouldn't have to learn anyone else's culture or language it's just like we didn't adopt the metric system oh my god when everybody else did like that's so crazy and like every time i was in chemistry class like i just had contempt for, for american arrogance because we did not adopt the metric system like everybody else. So when you have to do chemistry equations in this country, they are much harder than what they need to be because you have to convert everything. Which uh, is probably <laughs> why so many people don't understand math and science in this country. Yeah. We are extremely illiterate in these things because we have just shunned these topics. Yes. We don't have to learn them, you know? And the reason that, that we did that was because uh, the factory owners didn't want to pay to convert their equipment over to the metric system it was an unnecessary expense is that right yeah so so we just kept using the standard uh um, system rather than uh converting to the metric system and i i i i mean just it's it's just crazy like like, like, that's the american exceptionalism that we have here. right exactly right Yeah. (laughs) yeah we're exceptionally arrogant yes and a lot of people don't want to face this Mm -hmm. but especially in this country we do uphold white supremacy because we think that our founding fathers are the most exceptional people and they happen to be white males. Mm, Slave owners. (laughs) Slave owners. 
And it's been institutionalized. Like, our white nationalism has been institutionalized to where we segregate large groups of people from being able to participate in society. Mm -hmm. We disenfranchise different colors of people. And, yeah, like we said earlier, most people don't want to accept that. They just want to believe that they have all the success that they have because of their work ethic. Mm -hmm. When really, we oppressed large groups of people so that way you can have a better life yes and that's nationalism in full swing it is yeah so so nationalism i think that we've go ahead yeah well no that could uh trans what's the word transition transition (laughs) into a topic on immigration because that is another thing that right-wing ideology emphasizes Mm mm-hmm yeah, like the fact that we're building this wall is just, it's insane. Like, kind of building the wall. <laughs> kind of building it. I mean, Apparently like, there was a gust of wind that knocked down a section of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so just like Trump's economy, one yeah. little gust of wind or a little virus, everything comes crashing down. Yeah, but let, let's just get into the, like, that, that whole thing. Like, it, again, like, it, it, it's that in itself. The idea that immigrants are coming over and taking our jobs, Mm -hmm. okay? That in itself, and what the reality of that is, and what the real causes of that are, and it being pushed onto another group, the blame being pushed onto another group of poor people, Mm -hmm. is such... That one issue embodies how capitalism functions in itself. Because the real reason that white business owners in America use Mexican labor is so that they can pay them substandard wages, Mm -hmm. cheaper than American citizens, not give them benefits, Mm -hmm. and if they complain, they can threaten to have them deported Mm -hmm. uh, or rounded up by ICE or whatever the case may be. I mean, meatpacking plants and all the most horrible jobs out there are almost all illegals. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I hate calling them illegals, but I just... Undocumented. Undocumented, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, but yes, like, that is... Um, Those are the jobs that immigrants are coming over to do. Yes. In America. Exactly right. But we cannot take away the blame from the capitalists who shipped our jobs overseas, overseas. with... What is it, NAFTA? NAFTA, and well, and, and several other deals. Other trade point, deals you know. that took jobs out of, like, the Rust Belt. And yes. took them to China or... Yes. So, wherever so, so that and that's what the right does very well mm-hmm. redirecting rage mm-hmm. that is like their if they do one thing brilliantly at least with their base it's redirecting rage and people should have been furious at the ruling class for mm-hmm. what happened starting with NAFTA in the 90s all the good jobs outsourced to other countries um, and then again with um undocumented workers coming in they do the vast majority of the construction jobs especially in the west remember when we lived in colorado you barely saw a construction crew that was not all mexican and it's because those construction companies and the contractors know that they can get away with paying them less and not giving them benefits and getting more money for themselves and that's what it's always been about but they the right shifts the blame onto poor people that are fleeing desperate circumstances to try to come here and make a better life. And fleeing those circumstances due to our foreign policy decisions, Mm -hmm. such as the war on drugs, Mm -hmm. leading to cartel violence in all of these places. That's what they're running away from. And we destabilize their governments and install puppet dictators. Like, we have just ravaged Latin America. Yeah, oh, oh, for over and over again. And, yeah. and like and they, when they finally do win a victory and get somebody back in there who's halfway decent like Evo Morales, oh, you got to go. Yeah. You know, it, overthrow. It, anybody that, that is championing pro people policies in Latin America, their days are numbered. Like right from the start. And I haven't seen any deviation from this no. or that it's getting any better for them. It keeps happening. I mean, Venezuela, Venezuela is constantly under attack. Chile. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and it's it never stops. It never stops. So th- there's been no change in that policy. So when you are criticizing people for coming over the Mexican border, it, it shows a complete 
ignorance. And lack of empathy. uh, Exactly. Both of those things. Like, you have no idea what they're running away from. You don't care. No. Because of the lack of empathy, right? And you don't direct your anger at those who deserve it. The rich white business owners who outsourced your jobs Mm -hmm. and the rich white business owners who hire undocumented workers so that they can make higher profits. That's where the rage belongs. But because the right is so good at misdirected rage, this is where we're at. Exactly. And more to the point of immigrants coming over to the U.S., Mm -hmm. again, this white nationalist fervor, anti-immigration, that is being pumped out of our media makes us unwilling to let these immigrants in, even though, like you said, the U.S. destabilized their governments, created hostile, violent conditions for them to live in, Mm -hmm. and now they are fleeing it for asylum. But our media will tell you that they are coming over to rape and pillage and murder. So when they do come over here, and you've seen the videos recently of the white supremacists just telling them to go back to their country and putting hands on them because they just palpably hate them. They do that to American citizens that are brown. Oh, yeah, (laughs) for sure. But that, again, is because we have been programmed to hate the immigrants, Mm -hmm. hate the brown people because they have taken something away from us. And it always comes down to that, doesn't it? It always comes down to something is being taken from you. Yeah. The, when I say us, I mean Americans. Americans I do not yeah. identify with these uh, people. No, of course not. And my family is from immigration as well. Mm-hmm. Like, my family's from Puerto Rico mm-hmm. and Ita- in Italy. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, like, I don't identify with any of these people. <laughs> no. No, and, you know, the, that issue alone like really shows such a dangerous lack of empathy and it and it really like it makes me question you know what is human nature you know like it it makes me question i know how a lot of people end up like this and we're going to talk about like how people end up getting sucked into right-wing ideology in a second we're we're probably going to close with that yeah um go ahead Well, one more thing about immigration. It's interesting to note that some libertarians do actually like the idea of free-flowing borders. Yeah, some of them do. They Mm -hmm. still advocate for borders because you have to have your own country, your own state, whatever. But they think that people should be able to come in and out of countries freely. So they do respect like the, the freedom of movement yes. a lot more than some conservatives, yes. which I would like to give them credit for because I agree with that as well. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't just say, no, you can't come in because you're a citizen of this country yes. like we do now. Yes, exactly right. Um, so let's talk about what primes people to end up being susceptible to these ideologies because I think that's very important and because this video is called the psychology Mm -hmm. and we have talked about the psychology behind a lot of it but I mean really we need to talk about the entire life cycle of people who end up in conservative ideas I think because there are a lot of reasons why they end up believing what they believe and again we have to humanize them and we really have to start looking at our perceived adversaries as victims if we're mm-hmm. ever going to bridge the gap because if we just think that they're innately bad yeah we're not going to get anywhere and that's ultimately what we want to do i know that we poke fun sometimes you know because it, it's just it, it, it's a way of coping with their behavior you know to make fun of them because like it really is painful to watch what they're doing like it hurts me i know it hurts my soul to see how these people behave toward other people like it's very hard to look at like i just cannot believe that people are this awful to each other but ultimately we do need to be more cooperative we do and we have to see our shared enemy and come together based on that because we shouldn't be fighting each other that's mm-hmm. exactly what the elites want yes. is divide and conquer yes. and it's been extremely effective so far yes. but if we can bring empathy to understanding the mm-hmm. other side mm-hmm. then we'll have a lot more cohesive so let's talk about the psychology of how they end up like they do um, first of all the people on the right in general have contempt for psychology uh, very, very largely not all I mean there are some intellectual facets of the right but 
a lot of them uh, really don't uh, have a space for talking about their feelings. Like stoic masculinity is is very heavily promoted in the right wing. Um, Maybe start with childhood. Yes, yes. Um, we, we will. I'm just talking about like how they feel about us even analyzing their behavior. Like mm. they, they, they have nothing but contempt for it. You mm-hmm. know? Uh, but yes, let's talk about childhood. People that end up in, in heavily right-wing ideologies normally have been abused as, as children or at least had experiences of abuse in childhood. There's something that primes people for ending up rapidly selfish. It's not a natural human function to, especially on a, on a species that is absolutely dependent on cooperation for survival. We are the only, well, not the only species. I mean, there are some other species that are pretty vulnerable when they're first born, but humans more than anyone else. When we are born, we are helpless for like two years. <laughs> I mean, it's... More than that. Yeah, exactly. Leave a two-year-old by themselves to fend for themselves, they're not going to survive. I mean, like, they, they, at two, they can maybe start to, to learn how to cope with their environment and such. I, I'm just saying, like, as far as, like, completely helpless. Um, we depend on each other. We really do. So this whole idea that we're supposed to be individualistic is, it's troublesome. It really is. It goes against, like, the nature of who we are as organisms. But... In childhood especially, if you are subjected to certain things like far-right religion when you're a kid, if you're taught that authoritarianism Mm -hmm. is the way to be, there are just these positions of authority and you're just supposed to listen to them. Well, yeah, that's back to the the hierarchy. Exactly. Like you have to listen to your father. Mm-hmm. You have to listen to you know your your preacher. It doesn't matter whether they're right or wrong. You don't deserve an explanation. They, and if you don't listen, yeah. you may be physically reprimanded. Yes, and physical punishment is heavily corporal punishment, whatever you want to call it, is heavily promoted in conservative circles. Yeah, spare the rod, spoil the child. Exactly right. And like all of the like far right religious figures like James Dobson, like all these like really scary uh, authoritarian religious figures, they, they they emphasize the importance of like beating your children and stuff. <laughs> it's really messed up. It's really messed up. I mean, hey, maybe they're on to something because my parents didn't beat me and I have utter contempt for authority. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Maybe I should have gotten a few more whoopings. I spank you sometimes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, anyway. But yeah, authoritarian hierarchies. Yes. At a young age. Yes. And then you learn to pass that on to your children. Mm-hmm. So there's always that person who's above you that you have to answer to. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you just don't question it. And so we, we bring that model to our political leaders we look to them like trump is a messiah for the right wing and they look at him like he can do no wrong even if he says something outlandish and untrue they will defend him and say that he didn't mean what you thought he said they know him better and i i know a lot of trump supporters on a deep personal level like my, my closest relatives are trump supporters and i've known them for 40 years and honestly they're not bad people overall you know like a lot of them will give you the shirt off their back but they because their parent their parents and i know this for a fact were very authoritarian punished them physically severely were religious were religious and pushed that on them very very hard uh and psychologically abused them if they dared to step out of line of these beliefs uh horrific psychological abuse and then they end up in this spot where they don't question authority ever because, like, children's minds are very malleable. Mm-hmm. And if you put them in an environment where you are forcing this abuse on them, and I come out of it, so it's, it's a long road back uh, once you internalize this stuff. But some people who are more meek by nature, they're not very outspoken. Um... There's nothing more scary than change, you know? And and once they've been conditioned to accept authority for the sake of authority, 
it's very hard to get them to start being a different way, especially once they're set in their ways. And we should never be set in our ways. I don't think that that is human nature. Like we are meant to evolve as a species, not just as a species, but in our own personal life. I think that if you believe the same stuff that you did when you were a kid in any way, you're just not doing life right. And these people grow up believing something and they never change it until they're dead. <laughs> And that to me is, that's a fate worse than death from my perspective. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? Well, yeah. When you grow up to look too higher up, look to someone more powerful than you for answers, then mm-hmm. you never really learn to trust yourself. Mm-hmm. And so you don't think that you have the ability to change or develop new ideas Mm -hmm. outside of your own little structure and I think that also speaks to why people on the right are more individualistic because we or they (laughs) only protect their inner circle they don't really care what happens to the rest of society anybody they don't know as long as them and their family and their friends their tight inner circle Mm -hmm. are taken care of Mm -hmm. they're very uh, philanthropic to each other you know they'll help each other Like you said, they'll give you the shirts off their back. If you're like them. If you're like them. That's right. If you stray from these ideas, Mm -hmm. which like I said, if you're always looking to someone higher up for authority, Mm -hmm. then you don't trust yourself to stray away. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you do, then you're ostracized from your community. Conditional love. Conditional love. Conditional love, I think, is the cornerstone of the child abuse Mm -hmm. that kids that grow up in a conservative environment are subjected to. Mm -hmm. I've experienced it. I know what it's like when you have questions and you're condemned for having questions. Mm -hmm. When you're told that you're wrong and that's the devil trying to get into your head and it's a sin to question God. I know what that feels like. It's terrible. And (laughs) it's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't grow up with that kind of dogma. Mm-hmm. And then when we got together, <laughs> I just have to say this story. It's funny. Go ahead. Just your grandma, the first time she met me, <laughs> she just held my hand and looked me in the eye and said, I really wish you and Jeremy would get married. I'm like, we just met a month ago. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, so we have to be married to be... Uh, acceptable in God's eyes yeah. as a loving couple. You have to get right with the Lord. And because we never really did, she never really got very close to us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's so oppressive. You know, especially like, I just, I came out questioning everything. That was just my nature. Like, it, my, why was my answer to everything? Mm-hmm. I, I always, I just wanted to understand the world and how everything is. And Growing up in the Ohio River Valley, questioning things is not looked upon in a good light. And it really builds resentment, especially once you get older and you educate yourself. And uh, it's it's not good. You don't, you know, if anybody's listening to this, which I doubt, uh, that, <laughs> that, that is a highly uh, religious, highly conservative person, uh, don't do that to your kids. Like, re- <laughs> like really foster their inquisitive nature yeah and do not force authoritarian religion on your children it is a horrible idea um you're stealing the sovereignty that they have over their own mind Mm -hmm. you you know you not waiting until they are old enough to understand these things and forcing that on them while their brains are developing is child abuse it's horrific child abuse Mm -hmm. and People don't realize that, and they will not accept the responsibility of that. And try to convince someone that raised their kid religious that that's child abuse. You want to see some really angry, ultra-entitled reactions. Definitely try that. It it, it turns out really well, let me tell you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, And that's all part of the conditional love. Like, if you break the social conservative contract that Mm -hmm. they have laid out for you and your community Mm -hmm. by being gay or Mm -hmm. trying a new religion Mm -hmm. or, you know, any of those sort of deviancies, Mm -hmm. then you are no longer welcome because you are a threat to their existence. They have to question everything that they've ever learned or known or taught you. Mm -hmm. And that is extremely scary. Let me just say a statement declaratively because I believe this with every 
fiber of my being to the depths of my soul. If you disown a child mm. for dogma, for some imaginary belief system that somebody that you've never met just wrote down sometime. In a book thousands of years ago. Yes. You have failed at life in a way that's so spectacular that it's just... There's just no greater way to fail as a human being than that. Like, you really have bottomed out in, like, the depths of failure that a human being could hit in their life. And so, like, if you find out that your child is gay, but it goes against your religion and you cast them out of your life, you're saying that you're a failed parent? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, not a failed parent. Like, your life is forfeit unless you, ma- unless you make that right. Like, nothing else that you do matters yeah. unless you make that right. Because the one true responsibility that you had, you chose fear, because that's what that is. It's, it's a fear-based reaction, right? You chose fear over the love of your child. And I think that that's just something that's... Unforgivable. It's unforgivable. It really is. You can correct it. You can correct it and try to make up for it. But if your child does not forgive you for that, then they're within their rights not to do so. Um, But yeah, like that, that religion is definitely a strong cornerstone of most right-wingers. It's not that there's not right-wing atheists. There certainly are. But it's... It's an absolute necessary thing, and it's very hierarchical, which fits right into it. Like And patriarchal. And patriarchal. Like, don't question authority. Uh, women have their place. Yes, women are subservient to men. Yes, and, and religion in America especially has been used to enforce all forms of uh, capitalist um, othering. Like, it, it was used to enforce patriarchy. It was used to enforce racism, segregation. People like Jerry Falwell and others, like they preach segregation from the pulpit. That is a really interesting topic Mm -hmm. really quickly because a lot of... Back before segregation, the black community had its own economy, more Mm -hmm. or less. You know, Black Wall Street. In certain places. Which was torn down Mm -hmm. in the the Tulsa Massacre. Yeah. Um, But I think that is what caused desegregation to happen. And it wasn't just desegregation. Like, the capitalists didn't want black people to have power economically. They Mm -hmm. did not want them to be a monetary power. Mm -hmm. So they integrated them into white society, which actually stripped them of their power. It did not empower them to be desegregated in the sense that we think. It just made them less able to start businesses, less able to own homes, and less able to have the kind of success that white people have. Mm -hmm. So that was a driving force behind desegregation. Like like why the capitalists agreed to it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, obviously we never should have had a segregated society in the first place. Right. But but, but the motivating forces behind why the capitalists allowed it to happen was so that they could strip them of further economic power. Yeah. Because there's always an ulterior motive to everything that they do. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've heard that discussed before, actually. Um... I think let's let's uh, let's finish up by talking about um, specific like like a few a few more categories uh, just real quickly, like the alt right. Uh, I do want to talk about them real quick because like they seem to get off on just upsetting people. <laughs> uh, that that seems to be like their whole shtick. Really, is they get off on causing people to be upset and by inflicting pain. They really like to further victimize yeah. marginalized people. There is a sadism to, to their culture. Yeah. Uh, and, it, you know, how people are sucked into it, like, it, it's very complex. I mean, like, and, and that's the thing when I talk about the right being so much more well-coordinated. Like, going after gamers in particular by saying that their video games are being attacked by SJWs, you know, it's disgusting, but it's kind of brilliant in like a Lex Luthor way because you get these people that really only care. They don't know any knowledge of politics, right? They only care about like their video games and stuff because they're kids for the most part. And you use that to bring them into these other really toxic ideologies. Like half the people that were marching in Charlottesville didn't even know why the hell they were there. You know, <laughs> it's so crazy. Um, but yeah, like that that whole that whole. Uh, 
feeling of getting off on one-upping people like Ben Shapiro and all those guys love to do, right? Like, and you see the video titles like Ben Shapiro destroys uh, <laughs> this person. And again, it's that hyper-competitive one-upsmanship, right? Yeah, actually, Ben Shapiro helped me understand the alt-right a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I understand that the straight white male mm -hmm. is kind of the face of the right wing these days, mm -hmm. and everyone looks to them as the big problem with our society. Mm -hmm. So they might feel like they're under attack, and so they start to get very defensive, and they refuse to accept that marginalized groups like transgender people, black people, women, etc., intersectional oppression, they refuse to accept that as a real issue that we face in society because they don't want to be held responsible for the oppression that all of these groups are experiencing. I, I think that the alt-right attacks intersectionality a lot because like that really is the key to understanding like how all of our problems are connected. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest, like if you want to keep one thing secret in your uh, a far right person or a capitalist, it's that all of our problems are intersectional. Exactly. They all connect back to the same source. And, and if you suppress that, if you make learning about intersectionality being like dirty or uh, whatever the case may be. Just for leftist tears. Exactly, for leftist tears. Um, then you've successfully concealed like the key to understanding that the system is the cause of all these individual problems. And then you cause these young, straight, white males mm -hmm. to defend themselves and sort of rise up. And that's why you have things like the Proud Boys mm -hmm. and these Boogaloo Boys who are just like coming out of the woodworks to defend their white nationalism. It's like the only thing that they have going for them. But there is, you know, there, there is another aspect to like the, the alt-right and gaming culture being connected because especially now and it's not the parents fault necessarily because we have entered the time where you have to work like two jobs to even keep a roof over your kid's head especially if you're a single parent with like two or three kids you know so they're gone all the time and what do the kids do they're home they have to babysit themselves and like they just play video games all day long sometimes it's just a bad parent that doesn't really want to spend time with their kids and just says go play your games you know get out of my hair but a lot of times it's just they, they don't have a choice. They'd rather be home, but they don't have a choice in it, you know, and that leads to proximal abandonment, you know, which means that when parents do come home, even when they're there, they're just so exhausted and disengaged that they just are not emotionally available for their kids. And that can be very psychologically damaging as well. And then they're spending all their time playing video games for 15 hours a day where they're simulating murders all day long. <laughs> and then you wonder why these kids end up being completely antisocial and like having no empathy or compassion for people. Mm -hmm. They have hardly any human connections because everybody's socially awkward. Their parents are too exhausted to be there for them. And they're spending all day engaged in very violent simulated murders. So... Where does that lead somebody's psychology if, if that's your environment all the time? So, you know, that, that's, that's a big question in itself. And wasn't there some scandal where, like, Anita Sarkeesian was trying to poke holes in gaming culture, saying it was sexist, and, you know, just bringing to light some of the problematic themes in a lot of video games, and the alt-right thinks that Anita Sarkeesian's trying to take away video games. Gamergate. <laughs> yeah. Gamergate. <laughs> like, I, I never understood that because, like, I came to those same assumptions about video games that, like, how women were always damsels, and... Dress scantily clad. Exactly, and all that stuff. Like, I had those thoughts, like, as a conservative teenager, so I don't think that they're, like, too far left for most people. Because I just kind of like, you know, like girls never really have a prominent role in video games. I just thought that myself. Uh, so it's, it's a completely false argument. But that kind of invigorated the alt-right. Yeah, and, and that kind of plays into incel culture as well. Because like you have these forever alone guys who put themselves in that position by going down these rabbit holes where they start internalizing this toxic rhetoric that comes from the alt-right which makes them unattractive to everybody which further isolates them and further uh, increases you know the volatility of of their behavior 
and it's it, it's like this self fulfilling prophecy. Like because you're lonely, you get sucked into these systems that try to blame women for Makes why them you're, feel like they're the ones mm, being oppressed. Right, because it's always that's right wing ideology. You're like vi- the oppressors are the victims, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and then it does it just reinforces that cycle so you you believe more of that stuff so it makes you more unattracted to people so you end up more alienated and ostracized from society which means that you go deeper into it and you'll be able to be promote more angrily and then you end up like dylan roof or somebody that ends up just killing a bunch of people it, it's it's Oy. it's really crazy and uh yeah that that whole thing is is really worrisome so if you're a young man watch listening to this podcast yes and you are kind of just becoming conscious of these issues and you're kind of teetering between the left and the right and you're hearing these ideas do everything that you possibly can to hold on to your empathy please never forget your compassion for your fellow humans you do not have to live life in an individualistic manner. No. And we should all try to work toward being cohesive and having reciprocity and mutualism for each other. Yes. That is the only acceptable way for humans to be, in my opinion. I don't think that we are meant to be individuals. Mm-hmm. Like, we are a collective. Indeed. Let's finish up by talking about fascists. Oh, my favorite. Yeah, because they're probably the most relevant right now because I think what we're seeing, uh, the behavior out of not just our president, but a lot of uh, right-wingers in this country in the present moment is fascism, naked fascism. And it's... We're in a very precarious position right now. I mean, I see people on the left and the right saying that we feel like that we're headed for a civil war. I think the people on the right want it, and the people on the left kind of see it as an inevitability based on the way that things are going and by the ever-worsening conditions, both financially and rhetorically. Yeah, in a way, I think the people on the right wanted to forget that racism existed. They wanted to forget that there was oppression in this country and in the world. And the left is kind of bringing these issues back to the forefront because we are still suffering in so many ways, economically and socially. And so I don't know if the right exactly asked for this, but now that they feel again that they're being under attack, their way of life is being threatened, that yeah, they're all in on the race war if that's what it has to be, or civil war. I think many factions of the right have wanted this for a very long time. I uh, yeah. Yeah, white supremacists have pro- and and we've heard cops recently on recording saying oh, that they man. just can't wait to kill black people. Oh my god. Except they said it a lot more violently. Yeah. yeah. Um but you know, yeah, we have institutionalized racism and a lot of these people just can't wait for something like this. Yes. So even fascists as they're not pleasant, you know. <laughs> like it's really hard to see humanity in these people. Because like they really just seem like they want to hurt people. Like they really seem like they are operating from a a position of pure hatred. And they have no tolerance for varying views. They have no tolerance for anything outside of what they believe. So it's very hard to humanize them. It really is. But I think if we do look back about everything we've talked about so far, about that they most likely are the survivors of horrific child abuse. And they most likely have had very hard lives. And they have been under attack from one of the most sophisticated propaganda machines in the history of the human race. If you look at all of those things and try to humanize them, I mean... I don't, I don't have the answers in like how you start a conversation with these people. I really don't. I know that there are people that have uh, de-radicalized clan members and things like that by like getting them to empathize with the other side, and they've been successful at it. I don't know exactly what methods were used. I do think that if we try to come to them in a more reasonable, 
way and doing that in person is going to have to be the way that it happens because I don't think over the internet it's just going to happen. Uh, mm-hmm. It's too depersonalized. It's why a lot of people that are that are nice in real life find it very easy to be mean on the internet because it's it's a dehumanized experience, right? You're just talking to a screen. You're not talking to a person. You don't have to look them in the eyes. You don't have to see the pain on their face that you cause. You don't have to see any of that. You're just talking to a screen. So if we keep the if we keep the conversation online, I just I don't see it getting any better. No, I think you're right. We do have to have these conversations in person. And outside of the clan and like white supremacist groups, I think most people would not identify as a fascist. Right. But because we normalize fascist ideology through our president mm-hmm. and our media, mm-hmm. we let it slowly seep into our consciousness. Mm-hmm. So fascism is something that happens over time, slowly, without you realizing it. Mm-hmm. So you start to give up more social freedoms and all of these things eventually lead to a surveillance, a police state, mm-hmm. and then you're like, oh, wow, how did we get here? Mm-hmm. So, and then an ethno state. An ethno state. Eventually. Yeah. I mean, who historically are the fascists? Hitler? Mm-hmm. Mussolini? Mussolini. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just a... Uh, people are just so angry and resentful about how their lives have turned out that it makes them susceptible to this angry rhetoric. I mean, what have we said throughout this podcast? The right excels at directing rage toward false targets. Mm-hmm. And that that's what this all comes down to. We all have reasons to be angry. We're, We're all products of abuse. We are all products of abuse, absolutely positively. And what is happening to these people... I mean, we have to try to sympathize with them. We do. And I know it's hard. And I know that most people listening to this are probably like, F those guys, you know? But and we have those moments too. I, we definitely have those moments. I am not speaking to you as if I'm somebody that's conquered uh, talking badly to these people because I certainly have not. Um, if they catch me on a bad day and say something really heinous, like I'm prone to go off on them. <laughs> I know that I shouldn't, and it's not productive. But, man, like, I I get triggered. I'm not above being triggered. (laughs) I like to take the role of educating people, even though it's a futile exercise. I like to take the role. It just doesn't always work out, and I get frustrated when it doesn't work. But I think that we can humanize each other, both from the left and the right point of view, Mm -hmm. by realizing who our common shared enemy is Mm -hmm. and attack that not each other yes Yes, we have different ideas of how to take down the enemy who in my opinion are the one percenters the capitalist oligarchs who rule our governments around the world Mm -hmm. own all the resources and the laborers who create their products which they get rich off of those are our enemies and I think people from the left and the right can agree that greed is the problem of the world to an extent. To an extent, maybe, I don't know. But I think that if we can all kind of get to that position, then we'll have an easier time humanizing each other. I think people on the right are, are critical of, uh, you know, crooked business, but they... Crony say, capitalism. Crony capitalism, yeah, exactly right. right. Like, everything wrong with capitalism is automatically labeled as crony capitalism. And it's such an oversimplified... Sometimes they throw that out when it makes no sense. It's know? just from a lack of understanding, understanding. of history, and exactly, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I mean, the, I guess the point that we want to make is that, yes, people on the right are very infuriating. But if we do not start trying to approach them with more compassion and understanding, especially in real life, Things really aren't going in a good direction. They're not going to get better. And it's not that we're not justified in being upset with them. Of course we are. Of course we are. I mean, I think we all have a responsibility to control our base urges. We really do. Um, And and, and they choose not to. Um, And and that's just it. We all have the choice, right? We have the choice. We we can educate ourselves. I mean, like, and and when people reject the opportunity for education, especially in this day and age where information is so easily accessible, 
compared to what it once was. When they choose not to invest their time like pursuing real information, it can make you resentful of them. And just try to understand where they're coming from and, and how they've gotten here and try to humanize them. And if you know any of them in real life, try to approach them with compassion and see what happens. Yeah. That's I the think, be- I best think advice we can give. The hallmark of left-wing ideology is compassion, mm-hmm. humanitarianism. Mm-hmm. So let's just bring that to every conversation we have, no matter how different our ideology is. At least try to. At least try to. And if you're not successful, don't beat yourself up. It's very hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's pretty much all that we can cover about right-wing ideology. We would love to hear your thoughts on this subject, if we missed anything. And I'm always really curious to hear from people who have previously or are currently aligned with this sort of ideology. Mm -hmm. Um, If this was like part of your past, how did you come out of it? Like what life event did you experience that brought you to this place? So please share your stories with us in the comments section. We always love reading your comments. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, Those are all... Those, those stories are very important, but also like just whatever experiences that you've had with right-wing ideology in your life, please share those as well. Uh, we love reading life experiences, and, and as we talked about, we really want to get people on the show to, to have conversations and, and work through uh, these things in the future. Um, if you're able to, please support us on Patreon. We would really appreciate it. You can uh, find us at patreon.com slash freeradicals. Is that right? Um, I think so, yeah. We'll link it in the description. Or if you're more comfortable with a one-time donation, we have finally set up a PayPal account, and we will also link that in the description. But yeah, if you guys appreciate our work and you like these conversations, please consider helping us making this a full-time thing so that way we can spread these ideas and educate people because this is the time (laughs) for the awakening. So if you want to help us do that, we would be eternally grateful to you and a huge thank you to the people that have donated recently um, yes we, we have seen a few come through uh, uh on paypal especially and we really appreciate your support yes shout out to you guys yes um we so appreciate you being here tribe uh this was longer than the last conversation because we really wanted to flush out every aspect of right-wing ideology and where it comes from that we could so let us know if you appreciated this uh, we are working on a video project right now, mm-hmm. so just to let you know, we, we are working on one. We just we we've been having this conversation amongst ourselves, and we wanted to kind of put it out there to get your feedback on it. Please share our podcasts. Um, we don't really have the time to make videos and promote videos and make podcasts and promote podcasts, and we still have to make money. So if if you guys would please share this, especially on the podcast streaming platforms i believe it's on um spotify Spotify now and it's in the process of getting put up in other places um, or just share the youtube video we really appreciate you guys so much uh we love you tribe and if you haven't already join our facebook group the free radicals facebook group it's we're having awesome conversations in there yes so please give us our feedback on all this guys we really appreciate you and we will see you next time see you next time tribe love you guys Love you guys. Solidarity. Solidarity.